Good afternoon. We would like to welcome you to the Gabelli Fund's live webinar series. We're excited to be bringing you the first webinar of 2019 titled Invest Like a Mogul, A Bright Future in the World of Dr. John Malone. We are joined by Managing Director and Co-Chief Investment Officer of Value at Gamco Investors, Chris Morangi. Chris currently serves as Portfolio Manager of the Gabelli Funds and manages several funds within the Gabelli Gamco Funds Complex. Chris joined the firm in 2003 as a research analyst covering companies in the ca cable, satellite, and entertainment sectors. He began his career as an investment banking analyst with J.P. Morgan and later joined private equity firm Wellspring Capital Management. If you have a question during the presentation, you can enter it in the Q&A box in the presentation window. I'd now like to turn the call over to Chris. Great. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for your interest and your time. Um, so I'm going to uh, start with a brief history of Liberty Media share my view of uh, where the Liberty Complex is headed, and then uh, discuss why we're so excited uh, about this strategy. So first, some background on uh, our firm. Uh, we were founded in 1977 by Mario Gabelli, who remains chairman and CEO. The company went public in 1999. We're listed on the New York Stock Exchange under the symbol GBL. Uh, as of the end of uh, last year, we had about $34 billion of assets under management. Um, most of that, most of those assets are uh, in equities, and most of those equities are invested in our private market value with a catalyst uh, value approach. Uh, we are very much a bottom-up research-oriented firm, and we have significant com compounded accumulated knowledge in media telecom, which is especially relevant, of course, to Dr. Malone. Um, Next, uh, Chris already gave the background on, on me, uh, but I've been with the firm since 2003. I, again, I started as an analyst covering media and telecom in 2003, which, as you'll hear, was a very interesting time to begin covering the industry, uh, especially as it relates to liberty. So this is the man of the half hour, Dr. John Malone. Um, if you're not familiar with him, uh, I would recommend that you read Cable Cowboy, uh, which is a book that came out in 2002 that discusses uh, John's first career um, as a cable executive. Uh, the brief history is that in 1972, uh, John showed up outside of Denver at a little cable company called Telecommunications, or TCI. And over the next 25 years, he built it into the largest cable company in the world before selling it to AT&T uh, in 1998 and 99. Um, but the uh, the genius that, or one stroke of genius that, that John had along the way was that uh, distribution became more valuable if there was stuff to watch on, on television. And likewise, uh, content only really had value to the extent it was distributed. So he used that leverage with the uh, emerging content companies as, as the largest distributor in the country to take equity stakes in companies such as Turner, BET, QVC, and a number of technology and non-U.S. cable firms. That group of assets, uh, AT&T was not interested in, and John was able to convince management at the time to spin them off as a separate company called Liberty Media in 2001. And this is what happened since. A little bit difficult to read, but basically the second uh, stroke of genius that John had was that he could surface value by reducing the conglomerate discount on the sum of the parts of that basket of assets at Liberty Media. He used a significant amount of financial engineering uh, to uh, simplify, rationalize that basket, breaking them up into smaller pieces and eliminating or minimizing that conglomerate discount. And as, you'll, as you see on, on the slide, and we'll hear a little bit more later, that process is still ongoing. This is a summary of uh, what was done. So if you owned Liberty Media at its inception in 2001, you would have gone through 11 spinoffs or split-offs, gotten six tracker stocks, and three cash-rich split-offs and one reverse Morris Trust. If that sounds like gibberish to you, I would invite you to go to our website to look for a financial engineering white paper that I published last year uh, that discusses each of these transactions in detail. But you'd be left today with essentially investments in uh, 26 companies, 12 of them direct uh, from Liberty, and most of those have Liberty in their name, two pieces of paper from takeovers that subsequently happened, and then a further 12 companies in which Liberty is invested. Those 26 companies have an aggregate market cap of almost a half a trillion dollars. I should note that you'd actually have more, you have uh, investments in 26 companies, but you'd have more pieces of paper because along the way, Liberty has issued uh, securities with varying votes. 
So this is essentially the genesis of the idea for our uh, ETMF media mogul. We had lots of clients who were invested in John, who followed John, who asked, what do I do with all these pieces of paper? And so we made it easy with a one decision type of security. To simplify things, I put the investments that Liberty is involved with in four buckets. First, and, and the largest component of King Malone's realm, is broadband infrastructure, formerly known as cable. Uh, John, is the, John and his companies are the single largest shareholder of Charter Communications, the second largest broadband operator in the U.S. with about a, almost a quarter uh, stake. Liberty Global was, is the largest cable operator in Europe. That was the first spinoff from Liberty Media, and that subsequently spun off Liberty Latin America, which is the dominant cable provider uh, in that region. The second bucket I would call content creation. Uh, Discovery Communications was the second spinoff from Liberty Media, uh, and it's a unique uh, media company that it owns a significant amount of its nonfiction content. The company, of course, subsequently bought Scripps Networks, SNI, last year. There's also Lionsgate, which is a theater company as, well, as well as owner of the Stars Paybox. The third bucket uh, is probably where Malone has been most active of late, and that is in live entertainment, where Liberty holds stakes in uh, the Atlanta Braves, the Formula One Racing League, as well as uh, music assets Live Nation and Sirius XM. And then finally, due to John's historical relationship with another media mogul, Barry Diller, the company or Liberty has uh, interests in companies such as TripAdvisor, Expedia, LendingTree, as well as uh, QVC and HSN, now merged and the largest multi-channel uh, commerce retailer. Uh, this is not an eye test, uh, but it is a summary. It is our Rosetta Stone for what the uh, Malone universe looks like. And I invite you to, to download this off of our website where it's available or to talk to your Gabelli relationship person. It changes quite often, as you can imagine. Um, but the reason we do all this work is because historically, John and his team have made a lot of money for investors. And of course, uh, past results are no guarantee of, of the future. Uh, but we think that, that uh, the processes that, that and the philosophy that John has followed is very much institutionalized and, and repeatable. So a million dollars invested in Liberty Media in 2003, uh, right before the spinoff of uh, Liberty Global, will be worth about $4.6 million today versus $3.2 million if you invested it in the S&P 500. That's a compounded rate of 11% versus 8% for the S&P. And again, I think this is somewhat institutionalized. Uh, first, um, the, the first element of that formula, what we call the Malone Magic formula, is to invest within your circle of competence. And telecom and media is certainly in his circle of competence, uh, and it happens to be an area uh, that is very ripe for profitable investments. Uh, there are uh, significant opportunities for companies to create for themselves sustainable competitive advantages, for example. The second element in Malone's magic formula is to recruit and retain top talent. And this is probably underappreciated uh, uh, amongst uh, John Malone followers. But John has been able, starting with recruiting uh, Greg Maffei, who was formerly the CFO of Microsoft in 2005, to assemble a top-notch team of managers who uh, run these assets. Uh, the third element of the Malone magic formula is to capital each company efficiently. Um, Malone has been known to use leverage uh, very uh, efficiently over time, and that uh, remains the case today. And then finally, taxes. Pay less, pay later is the philosophy uh, that John follows. He's probably the single best, uh, most tax-savvy investor, um, rivaled only perhaps by uh, Warren Buffett. So the future, and, and, and here's why we're excited about uh, uh, in, investing in John today. Um, there are four, I think, drivers for, for future returns, and these probably aren't that different than what drove returns over the last 10 years. But first, is there's room for f further financial engineering. Uh, Liberty Sirius, which owns 70% uh, uh, of Sirius XM radio, uh, it trades at about a 36% discount to the underlying Sirius company. And uh, I think there's a significant opportunity to reduce that discount. Uh, secondly, there's something called the Charter Stack, the two Liberty companies that own stakes in Charter. Uh, if you have an opportunity to buy uh, those companies, GCI Liberty or Liberty Broadband, and create Charter for a significant discount to where it trades today. 
Second, uh, synergy realization. Uh, the um, Malone has been very active uh, over the last several years, um, in including in merging QVC and HSN in the uh, pr proposed takeover of Pandora by Sirius, as well as Charter's uh, takeover of Time Warner Cable. Uh, and those are all uh, in, in various stages of integration and turnaround. Third, um, there are other parts of the portfolio that are, are currently in harvest mode or, or could be in harvest mode soon, uh, namely Liberty Global, which has agreed to sell its German operations to Vodafone for 11 or 12 times EBITDA, which makes the remaining Liberty Global, which consists primarily of its investment in the UK cable systems, very attractive. Uh, Charter has been a frequent, top, a frequent uh, candidate for uh, M&A consolidation. Um, they've held talks reportedly with uh, uh, SoftBank as well as Verizon and perhaps some others. Uh, those could re be rekindled at some point in the future. And then, of course, there's uh, the investments in some of the commerce companies, notably TripAdvisor, which would be a very attractive for some of the larger Internet uh, uh, entities. And then finally, uh, Liberty Media has, has uh, shown a, uh, a propensity to redefine itself and reinvent itself over time. Uh, the investment in, in Sirius XM was, was one example, as was the, exam, as the investment in Formula One. And we believe that Liberty um, looks at a lot of different investments, including in the music industry, where uh, they can uh, bring some of their advantages to create and surface value for uh, shareholders. So before we get to questions, I do want to uh, talk about one specific stock. It is a significant holding uh, of a media mogul. And that is what I call the ultimate franchise business, the Atlanta Braves, held uh, in an entity called Liberty Braves, which is one of the tracker stacks uh, in the Liberty Media Group. So Liberty Braves has the equivalent of about 60 million shares. The stock is about $26. Market cap is $1.6 billion. There's $400 million of, of net debt for just under $2 billion enterprise value. For that, you get uh, a lot of history. Uh, the Braves are actually the oldest uh, continuously operated sports franchise in the U.S. Uh, they started as the uh, Boston Red Stockings in 1871 before moving to Milwaukee and then to their current home in Atlanta. Uh, and um, the team is, the current team is, is very young and, and very much on the upswing in their new stadium. So putting the, the, the pieces together, I would think the team is probably worth something over $2 billion if it were sold today. Uh, there's a, a accompanying real estate development that we think has a net value of around $400 million. And then there's other significant assets associated uh, with this group including their interest in some uh, league uh, assets. You put those together, uh, $2.8 billion, again, subtract the $400 million or so of debt and divide it by the number of shares, and we think that value uh, is over $40 uh, today compared to uh, a market price of 26 or 27 Some of the catalysts, and these are uh, obviously events that, that we think we focus on, uh, uh, events that we think will narrow that gap between uh, the current market price and, and what we estimate as private market value. First, uh, the team is entering its third year in its new stadium. Uh, the first two years have shown quite a bit of momentum in terms of increased uh, per capita revenue. Second is an opportunity to perhaps restructure or, or purchase its uh, regional sports network currently controlled uh, by Fox. Uh, third, um, ultimately, we do think that this will be spun off from the Liberty Media Group and become a normal company and not a tracker stack. There's an opportunity to put that real estate in a REIT, uh, and eventually the end game, uh, we believe, will be a, a monetization uh, of the team. Okay, just a couple questions here that came in offline. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so uh, the fund has significant exposure to cable. How do you think the future of those companies, given the changes, uh, in, in consumer behavior. Sure. So we've we've been investing in the cable industry for uh, over 40 years, and uh, have seen a lot of uh, competitive threats to the industry over that time. Um, we've been, for the last decade or so, we've been talking about what we call the broadband hedge. That is, uh, no matter how uh, you consume content uh, or what content that may be, whether it's Netflix or Hulu or the traditional pay TV package. You're going to need uh, fast uh, broadband to do that, uh, and in three quarters of the country, that fast broadband is almost exclusively av uh, available from your local cable company, which gives them significant pricing power. And the, that revenue, that broadband revenue, uh, doesn't have to be shared with, for, for the most part, by uh, by content partners. Um, so it's very, very high margin. So the the industry has already transitioned. Um, 
for most of the major cable companies, broadband is probably more than half of gross profit today, uh, and that uh, trend should continue, and we think warrants much higher multiples than our core of the industry. All right, we just got a question here that in the chat from Patrick. Uh, saying, Chris, thanks for the call. What are your thoughts on the smaller content companies, uh, DISCK, AMCX, in the relation to the larger Internet content players like Netflix, Amazon, Google, Apple, and how do you see the players competing going forward? Yeah, so uh, Dr. Malone is uh, famous for, uh, at least amongst in media circles, for uh, coining the phrase uh, free radicals, and uh, he used that term to describe some of those smaller uh, content players like Discovery and AMC that are referenced in the question, and his point is um, there needs to be consolidation, and, and this was this was before uh, Disney um, uh, made their uh, offer for, for 21st Century Fox, um, and um, I think that that is just indicative of, of what we see as well, which is uh, a pressure to get bigger. Um, to get become globally scaled. So uh, my belief is that Discovery will either buy additional programming assets or they will get bought. Um, and just frequently the large uh, uh, Internet companies, West Coast-based companies, get uh, come into the conversation about uh, being buyers. Um, I don't think that's going to happen soon, but um, you can never count it out. They clearly have uh, companies like Apple and, and Google and Amazon have certainly have so giving ambitions with regard to uh, uh, with regard to content and, and video, and um, uh, perhaps the most efficient way for them to to scale up would be to buy these companies. And another question here from Mike, uh, Chris, can you share your current thoughts on Liberty Global? The share price has been under severe pressure in the last month. Yeah, well, the uh, the share price has been under severe pressure for longer than that, unfortunately, um, and and that uh, is despite what we think is a very accretive deal. Um, as I mentioned in my remarks, um, the company uh, agreed to sell its second largest asset um, and probably best market, uh, Germany, uh, to Vodafone for for eleven and a half times EBITDA. Um, and uh, assuming that deal closes, and I think there's probably a eighty percent plus probability that it does. Uh, uh, get approved and closed sometime in the middle of this year. The rump, the remaining assets, which consists primarily of, of uh, the cable systems in, in the UK, uh, Switzerland, and, and a half interest in the Netherlands, uh, trading for something like five times EBITDA, which uh, is um, which would make it probably the cheapest uh, public cable asset in in the West, uh, and um, and and a, and a bargain. So there's a lot of uncertainty around whether that closes and what Liberty chooses to do with the proceeds from that transaction. Um, I think having followed them for many years, it's pretty clear what they'll do with at least a significant portion of those uh, proceeds, which is to buy back a lot of stock if the uh, if the price uh, remains where it is today. All right, we'll finish up with one more question here. Um, what are some of the catalysts you're most excited about over over the next two years? Yeah, so uh, I think one of the reasons that we think uh, Liberty is so the Liberty Complex is so interesting today is um, that we think these companies can perform very well no matter the uh, economic backdrop. Um, a lot of these companies are uh, not as cyclically exposed as others. Uh, it's cable companies, subscription radio, uh, sports assets uh, tend to be pretty stable and and have recurring revenue type uh, businesses. Um, in addition, I think there are a number of what I would call internal catalysts, things that the group can do irrespective of, of the outside environment, and those include, again, some things I've alluded to, like uh, collapsing the uh, uh, the Sirius holding by Liberty Sirius and realizing a significant portion of that discount, as I mentioned, is kind of in the mid-30s today. Um, so, so uh, I think that is a, a big opportunity, uh, Liberty Sirius in particular. Um, I think there's an opportunity to rationalize uh, the charter stack um, by owning, uh, by, by consolidating GCI Liberty and Liberty Broadband. Uh, and I think uh, I do think that there are some opportunities to um, to uh, monetize some of these individual assets, uh, including the Braves. Great, thank you so much, Chris. We appreciate your time here today, and we would like to thank everyone for joining the webinar. If you have any further questions or anything you would like we, us to provide, please follow up with your respective investment representative or you can call 1-800-422-2000.
2274. Thank you, and we hope you have a great afternoon.